clearly visible in the winter sky at night. Good evening and a very happy New Year to you all. Let's hope that 1993 is an improvement on 1992, which, um, come to think of it, wouldn't be awfully difficult. So what's in store for us? First of all, we're going to have two eclipses. On May the 21st, there's going to be a partial eclipse of the sun, when the moon partially hides the sun's disk. That's a photographic of a past partial eclipse. Not very exciting. You can't see the sun's corona and atmosphere. For that, I'm afraid, in England, you've got to wait until 1999. But on November the 29th this coming year, there's going to be a total eclipse of the moon. And this is a photograph of the last lunar eclipse in December, taken by Douglas Arnold. And you can see the moon is almost covered by the Earth's shadow. And I'm not going to say that lunar eclipses are important, because they're not, but they're interesting and they're fascinating to watch. So look out for one on November the 29th next. There are various planets around. You can't mistake Venus shining in the western sky after sunset. So brilliantly, it looks almost like a small lamp. We have Mars, too. And in the early hours, we also have Jupiter shining very brightly. And the other night, I looked at Jupiter through my 15-inch telescope, and I made that drawing, south at the top, of course, as always. Now, normally, you have two main belts on Jupiter, one to either side of the equator. But at the present moment, the south equatorial belt and the south temperate belt seem to have virtually disappeared, and I've never seen Jupiter like that. And just in passing, we've had a superb picture sent back from the Hubble Space Telescope of the volcanic satellite Io. And there it is, and you can see the volcanoes, previously seen only from the Voyagers. So now with Hubble, we can go on monitoring them. And that, I think, demonstrates yet again that even though it does have a faulty mirror, there are many ways in which the Hubble telescope can still outperform any telescope based on the Earth's surface. So it's by no means a failure. Of course, at the moment, the evening sky is dominated by Orion the Hunter. I think the most magnificent constellation in the sky, high up in the south, and you can't mistake it, with his two brilliant leaders, the orange-red Betelgeuse and the brilliant white Rigel. Of the two, Rigel is the brighter, but Betelgeuse is immensely large. In fact, it is so big, it could swallow up the entire path of the Earth around the sun. There it is. The diameter of Betelgeuse is 250 million miles. So it really is a red supergiant. And the red color is obvious with the naked eye and very striking in binoculars. And you can see it there on the photograph. All around over to the left, Betelgeuse top left, and you can see it really is decidedly orange. And below the three stars of the belt, you see the Great Nebula, M42, the most magnificent gaseous nebula in the entire sky, a kind of stellar nursery over a thousand light years away where fresh stars are being born. That's a small-scale picture I took myself, and here are details in the Orion Nebula, a superb sight with even a small telescope. And it shines because of four very hot stars on the near side of it. You can see them there right in the middle of the picture, and they're known as the trapezium because they do form that kind of shape. And certainly the Orion Nebula is a superb object. But of course, Orion is our best sky guide. Follow the line of the belt downwards and you will come to Sirius, the dog star, the brightest star in the sky. It's one of our nearest neighbors, only eight and a half light years away, something like 50 million million miles, 26 times as powerful as the sun and pure white. But although Sirius is a pure white star, it seems to flash various colors of the rainbow. Now, that's nothing directly to do with Sirius itself. Star twinkling is due entirely to the Earth's atmosphere, which, so to speak, shakes the starlight around as it comes down. And a star that's high up will twinkle very much less than a star that's low down. Let me show you what I mean. Here we have an observer looking at two stars, one high up and the other, over to the right, much lower down. And you can see that the light from the lower star is coming through a much thicker layer of atmosphere. Therefore, it's more shaken about and it twinkles more. And Sirius shows that effect particularly, partly because it is so bright and partly because, as seen from here, it's always rather low down. It's well south of the celestial equator. But as I said, it's 26 sun power and there are many stars much more luminous than that. For example, Rigel in Orion is at least 60,000 times as powerful as the sun, and possibly rather more. But it doesn't look so bright. 
because it's very much further away. Here we have an impression of our yellow sun. Let's go away from it and now bring in Sirius at eight and a half light years. Some distance, but wait, and now let's bring in Rigel at over 900 light years. And from there, Sirius and the sun would seem very close together. And remember, when you look at Rigel now, you're seeing it not as it is, but as it used to be in the days of William the Conqueror. Ever since then, the light now reaching us from Rigel had been travelling across space towards us at 186,000 miles every second, which is quite a thought. From Oran, we can also find Procyon in the Little Dog, and the two twins, Castor and Pollux. And if you look at them, you will see they are not alike. Pollux is the brighter and decidedly orange in colour, whereas Castor is white. But telescopically, you will see that Castor is made up of two. It really is a binary system, like that. And in fact, each of those components is itself double, and there's a third double companion. So altogether, the system of Castor is made up of six stars, four bright and two dim. And if you could go there, well, this is the kind of thing you might see. Although, frankly, I don't think the Castor system is suitable to have a planet in it, let alone an inhabited one. So let's come back now to our map and find Capella in Auriga, the charioteer, a bright yellow star very near the zenith or overhead point. And from Oran, we can also find Aldebaran in Taurus, the bull, which is a red star like Betelgeuse, and from that extend the little V-shaped cluster of the Hyades. And there too we have Alnath, or Beta Tauri, which is about as bright as our pole star. But oddly enough, Alnath used to be included in Auriga, and for some reason, I can't tell you why, the International Astronomical Union, the controlling body of world astronomy, took Alnath away from Auriga and transferred it to Taurus. And so Gamma Aurigae became Beta Tauri. And frankly, I don't know why, because I think it rather obviously belongs to the Auriga pattern, whereas Taurus has no definite shape at all. But in Taurus, we do have the most magnificent open cluster in the entire sky, the Pleiades, or Seven Sisters, easily visible with the naked eye and known since antiquity. This is a small-scale picture of it, but a large-scale picture shows there are many stars. With the naked eye, you can see at least seven, probably rather more, but with, a, with the telescope, many hundreds are there. And all these stars are young and hot and very luminous and blue-white. Also from Oran, we can find the constellation of Perseus, the hero. Not really very distinctive, but it does contain one important star, the demon star, Algol, and there it is. Normally, it shines of the second magnitude, that's about the same again as the pole star. But every two and a half days, it winks, taking four hours to fade down, remaining faint for 20 minutes, and then gradually brightening up again. But it's not a genuine variable star at all. It's what's called an eclipsing binary, made up of two components going together around their common center of gravity, and one rather larger, but less brilliant than the other. And what happens is that the fainter star goes in front of the brighter, and therefore, cuts out some of the light, and we have a long, slow wink. And that happens every two and a half days. Very often, of course, that happens in daylight, but at 2 a.m. on January the 25th, there is a minimum due, and if you look at Algol then, you will see it is well below its ordinary brightness. There are plenty of these eclipsing binaries in the sky, but Algol is the best known of them. So far, I haven't mentioned our other great sky guide, Ursa Major, the Great Bear, the Plough, whatever you call it, which never sets over England, and therefore you can't mistake it. And the two pointers show the way to the Pole Star. And there is a photograph of Ursa Major. Look at the second star on the tail, that second on the left, and you'll see a fainter star close beside it, Mizar and Alcor. And with a telescope, you'll see that Mizar itself is double, and there are plenty of these doubles around. Not very far away from Ursa Major is Leo the Lion, which is now coming into view. And between Leo and the twins, there's the rather obscure zodiacal constellation of Cancer the Crab. But it is distinguished by one thing, the lovely open star cluster Praecipi, easily seen with the naked eye, and with binoculars or a telescope, a superb sight. It's also known as the manger or the beehive. And I've never understood why the ancient Chinese used to call Praecipi the exhalation of piled up corpses. Doesn't look a bit like that to me. But that entire area of the sky is now dominated by the red planet Mars, which is brighter than any star apart from Sirius, and of course is distinguished by its strong color. 
And this photograph, again by Douglas Arnold, shows Mars, the brightest thing, not very far away from the centre of the picture. Now, Mars is there. Also, as I've said, in the evening sky, there is Venus. Now, Venus and Mars are the two closest planets to us, and I thought for once it might be an idea to have a look at them and do a bit of what we call comparative planetology. So let's have a look first at the inner part of the solar system and see the orbits of the four inner planets, Mercury, Venus, the Earth, and Mars. And they go around the Sun in different distances, at different rates, and in different periods. Mercury at an average of 36 million miles in 88 days. Venus, 67 million miles in nearly 225 days. The Earth, just under 93 million miles in 365 and a quarter days. And Mars, 141 and a half million miles in 687 Earth days. So there are the inner planets. Their orbits are different, their movements are different, and their sizes are different. In fact, Venus and the Earth are about the same size. Mars, much less so, and Mercury, smaller still. And that means their gravitational pulls are not the same. Venus and the Earth can hold on to dense atmospheres. Mars, with a much weaker pull, could hold on to not very much, and Mercury, none at all. So in that respect, Venus and Mars are very different. And as seen from Earth, they seem to behave in different ways. Now, Venus is closer to the Sun than we are. Obviously, only half of it shines. The Sun lights up only half. And when Venus is more or less between the Sun and the Earth, its dark side is turned towards us, it's new, and we can't see it. Then, as it moves along, a little of the lighted side is turned towards us, and at the moment, Venus is just about there, we're seeing half the lighted side. And when Venus goes on to the far side of the Sun, all the daylight side is turned towards us, and it's full, but of course, it's almost behind the Sun, and you can't see it. So in many respects, Venus is an awkward thing to observe, even though it can come within 25 million miles of us, and that's closer than Mars can ever get. But Mars is further away from the Sun than we are, and behaves differently. There we have the Sun, the Earth and Mars, almost lined up, as they are at the moment, and Mars is therefore at opposition and best place for observation. And clearly, Mars never shows phases in the same way that Venus does. So they behave differently, and uh, telescopically, they look very different. Here's a drawing I made the other night of Venus, and half of it's shown there. In fact, at the moment, Venus is almost a perfect half. But you are not going to see any surface details, because Venus is permanently covered with a dense, cloudy atmosphere, and we can't see through it. All we could do before the space age was to analyze the atmosphere and find out it was made chiefly of the heavy, unbreathable gas, carbon dioxide. But the only way to see the surface is by sending probes there, and this is what the Russians have done. And here's a picture sent back by a Russian probe showing an orange rock-strewn surface, part of the spacecraft, and of course intensely hot. And on Venus, the surface temperature is not far short of a thousand degrees Fahrenheit. And there's an impression by Paul Doherty of what Venus may be like if you could get there. Now, Mars is very different. There are three drawings I made the other night with my 15-inch telescope. Those dark markings are not old seabeds, they are merely areas where the red, dusty stuff has been scoured away by winds in the thin Martian atmosphere. And the one in the middle on the left-hand side is called the Certis Major. Now, Mars has a day, or sol, of 24 and a half hours length. And therefore, we can watch Mars spin. And as you can see, when I made the second drawing, the Certis Major was almost gone to the left-hand side, and on the third drawing, it had gone completely. And we can time the rotation period of Mars like that. So the Martian day, or sol, 24 and a half hours. Not so with Venus, because Venus has a weird day. As I've said, it takes nearly 225 Earth days to go around the Sun, but it takes 243 days to spin once on its axis. And therefore, if you could stand upon Venus and see the Sun, it would rise in the west and set in the east 118 Earth days later. But of course, you couldn't actually do that because from the surface of Venus, you'd never see the Sun at all. The sky is permanently hidden. So in that respect, too, in the length of their days, Venus and Mars are very different. So what about the surface? Well, spacecraft have been to both, and based on that, we can produce videos of what you will actually see travelling over the surface. So let me take you, first of all, to Mars, and go over the so-called Valles Marineris, the great trench upon Mars. Totally unlike anything we have on Earth, our Grand Canyon, the pale into total insignificance behind that one. 
and then we come on to the great Martian volcanoes. There they are, taller than our Mount Everest and topped by large craters. And there's nothing quite like that on Earth. In fact, Olympus Mons is 15 miles high. And whether those craters are extinct or not is something we don't know. So that is Mars. When we come to Venus, of course, we can't actually see the surface. We have to get our, our simulations from the radar results. But there again on Venus, there are huge volcanoes. You can see them there. And these volcanoes, those of Venus, are probably active. And so there may be active volcanism going on on Venus even now. So in that respect also, Venus and Mars are decidedly different. Then there's the question of moons or satellites. And here again, there are differences. Venus has no satellite. We have one, our familiar moon. Mars has two, Phobos and Deimos, but they're both very small. Here's an Earth-based picture, a very overexposed Mars to the left, and the two tiny satellites over to the right. And both were imaged by the Viking probes. Here's Phobos, less than 20 miles across, and here is Deimos, even smaller, at less than 10 miles across. And I'm quite sure that they are not genuine satellites at all, but simply ex-asteroids captured from the minor planet belt in the remote past. So why are Venus, the Earth, and Mars so different? And I'm quite sure the result is they're different distances from the Sun. Venus is so much the closest in. According to current theory, when the Sun was formed, it was less luminous than it is now. And quite likely, Venus and the Earth, at least, started evolving along same lines, although Mars, smaller and less massive, lost its atmosphere more quickly. But Venus and Earth may have developed the same kind of oceans, the same kind of primitive life. But then, gradually, the sun became hotter, and Venus was right in the danger zone. So the seas boiled away, the carbonates were driven out of the rocks, and in a fairly short time, Venus changed from a potentially life-bearing world into the furnace-like environment that it is today. Earth was just out of harm's way, and of course Mars was different, for the atmosphere was leaking away, and any life there can't have got very far. We have searched for it. The Viking soft landers came down there, they scooped up material from the red deserts, drew it back inside the spacecraft, analyzed it and sent back the results. And I think most people expected to find primitive life, but we didn't. And it seems that at the moment, at least, Mars has no life on it. Although there certainly was running water in the past, and there may have been life there that has now died out. We'll only know when they get samples back. And that brings me to looking into the future. Can we ever go to these worlds? Well, I don't think we're going to get as far as Venus. It may be nearer than Mars, but it's in totally unfriendly. And that could be the kind of scene you'll get on Venus now with active volcanoes. A surface temperature nearly 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit, a choking carbon dioxide atmosphere, and clouds of sulfuric acid, as alien as it can be. But Mars is different, and there could be a Martian base sometime in the next century, and it could look something like that. Certainly, Mars is less unfriendly than any other world in the solar system except the Earth. So, do look at these two outer planets now. Venus in the west after sunset, Mars visible all night. Compare the two, and then reflect that we are really very lucky to live on a world such as the Earth. Finally, don't forget it's newsletter time. If you want your newsletter, send your envelope to Newsletter 48, Sky at Night, BBC TV, London w 7 rj or tune in to CFAX 6H5, or if you want the latest information, ring up information line 0898 When I come back next month, we're going to go to America, and I'm going to take you to the VLA, or Very Large Array, the most powerful radio telescope installation in the entire world. And so until then, good night. <laughs>